So uh, if you guys would go back to the last section we were looking at, which was 5-6, toward the end of the period we were looking at the Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. And uh, it was the end of the period and we were going kind of fast just trying to get done with this, uh, the notes. And I want to just make sure that we're kind of clear on that idea because it will come back and get us in later chapters. It's a pretty important idea. And the idea is that when you take the temperature of something, particularly when we're talking about gases here, um, we can calculate the average velocity for those gas particles at a given temperature. But we got to keep in mind that it's just an average and we got a wide range of velocities for those particles. Some particles will be moving near zero, at least for a moment of time, while others are moving much, much faster. When we measure the kinetic energy uh, or the temperature, we're also measuring the kinetic energy. And again, we're measuring the average kinetic energy for those particles at that temperature. So the average uh, energy of motion. So we see that here with a, a sample of oxygen at standard temperature and pressure that in that sample at, at uh, zero degrees Celsius and 273 Kelvin, we still got a range of temp uh, uh, velocities for those particles. Um, and it tends to kind of, uh, you know, be this bell shaped curve, but it tends to fade out more towards the uh, faster velocities because you can go faster and faster and faster, but as far as going down to zero, you can't go any slower than zero. So uh, it's a little bit tighter at that end. And uh, over here, we've got, again, uh, nitrogen gas um, at three different temperatures. And what we find is that when the temperature is greater, the curve gets spread out over a wider range of velocities. Um, same number of particles under each curve here, but um, the range of velocities spreads out. And fusion, I just wanted to show you this thing again. Um, because there is on this PAGT thing, a little energy thing where we can look at the kinetic energy of particles. Um, when I first introduced the particles into the chamber, give them a pump, they're all taking off at the same velocity. They all have the same kinetic energy, but it doesn't take long before they start bumping into each other, bumping into the walls of the container. And some are moving very slowly until they collide with somebody else. And then they take off a little bit faster. And then, so you got particles going at different ranges, different velocities here. And if you look over here, this is the uh, Boltzmann distribution, the number of particles that we have and the speed. And if you look at the particles, you do get that curve and it does taper off towards the uh, faster ones. Every once in a while, you'll see one fast particle that's just kind of shooting off to the side there, at least temporarily. Um, if we heat it up, we should be spreading out that distribution or that range more faster particles, but just a wider distribution. You're still gonna have one in there. You can always seem to find that guy that just like not doing anything, barely going anywhere, at least temporarily. Um, now, if I was to add a lighter gas in there, just for a comparison, lighter gas is moving faster to begin with. Uh, if I look at the kinetic energies, here, I'll do that. Just kinetic energy, not velocity. Um, uh, I should put about the same number of particles of red and blue in there. If I look at the blue kinetic energies, we got this range. Some are moving fast, some are moving slow, so they get a little bit different uh, amount of kinetic energy. If I look at the red, it's pretty much the same um, because we're at the same temperature. <laughs> same average kinetic energy uh, because we're at 844 Kelvin for both particles. Um, but again, it's an average based on those velocities. If I go back here and look at the speed calculation, um, 
I see that the red ones have a wider distribution. They're moving faster in general, and they got a wider distribution of velocities over that range. And maybe I can, uh, I know, maybe if I pump more red in there, we'll get a deeper graph to look at. It's a little bit more pronounced. Cool it down, and uh, the blue will tighten up over here. The Boltzmann distribution will tighten up for the blue, and the red starts to tighten up as well as we slow things down. And the kinetic energy is pretty much the same for red and blue, just because uh, they're at the same temperature. If you bring out enough ice, you can bring the temperature down to absolute zero. Just got to have enough ice. Good ice maker. By putting a freezer in a freezer in a freezer, that's how they make a absolute zero. Of course, everything would be a solid by now, so this thing has already failed in its animation. It would have condensed into a liquid, turned into a solid, and uh, molecular motion should be nothing right now. Oh, well. No speed, no kinetic energy if you don't have molecular motion. And the pump freezes. Now, if I heat it up a lot, they all come out. Oh. I broke it. <laughs> Even fire doesn't affect this anymore. And I guess they are. I didn't even notice that the speed was up here. Oh, it's like the unleashing of the plague in the corner over there. <laughs> and obviously, these velocities are not uh, animated to proper speed because if they're moving at hundreds of miles or hundreds of meters per second in that uh, diagram, it would be uh, hard to even see them. It would be a blur. All right, no playing around. Um, let's go to a few things about effusion and diffusion. And this is 5.7. And uh, we're going to look at 5.7 and 5.8 today to finish things off. The textbook, at least the new textbook, actually has uh, 5.7 five, five, and 5.8 today. They have a 5.9 and a 5.10. One of them's on atmospheric chemistry, and one of them talks about a couple gases in more detail. Um, nothing specific in there that we need to know for the, the test or the AP exam, so um, we're just skipping those last two sections. <clears throat> All right. Diffusion and diffusion. If we look first at diffusion, to describe the mixing of gases. The rate of diffusion is the rate of the mixing gases. So for example, if you have this, uh, they like to use this kind of glass connected thing here. You got a, a chamber of uh, gas over here, chamber of gas over here, you've got a valve in the middle, so the stopcock valve is kind of the same thing you'd have at the bottom of a burette. When it's closed, the gases are on both sides, they're kept separate from each other. You open up the valve and the gases can begin to mix with each other and they will diffuse into each other um, through that opening. The uh, size of the gas particles will influence how fast they mix with each other because lighter particles move faster and they're going to bounce off each other more frequently and mix uh, quicker and slow heavy particles are going to be slower to mix uh, because of their velocity. Then if we look at uh, the next diagram, diffusion. 
is a term used to describe the passage of a gas through a tiny orifice into an evacuated chamber. Um, it's a gas basically leaking from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure through a tiny, tiny opening. So in the left-hand side of the um, container, more pressure because we've got more gas particles in this volume of space. On the right-hand side, uh, it's mostly empty. It looks like one particle is already effused over there. So it's a lower pressure system, high pressure to low set pressure through a tiny opening. This is a pretty uh, common thing to happen, for example, in latex balloons. If I fill up a latex balloon full of helium, it won't take very long, a couple hours, and you'll just see that balloon has shrunk in half in size. A couple more hours, it shrinks again by half because latex has a lot of tiny microscopic pores in it, and the fast-moving helium or hydrogen, doesn't matter, helium balloon or hydrogen gas, whatever I put in there, uh, bouncing off the walls of the container, find those tiny openings, and infuse under pressure through those small openings. Thomas Graham, a Scottish chemist and the creator of the Graham Cracker, found experimentally that the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the masses of its particles. Okay, there's a small fib in there. I'll let you guess what the fib is. Um, this makes it more interesting. Uh, more commonly, this concept is stated as Graham's law of effusion. So it does what it says up here. The rate of effusion of gases, so the rate of gas A compared to the rate of gas B, inversely proportional to the square root of its, the mass of its particles. So here's the molar mass of B, here's the molar mass of A. You'll see that B is down here and the mass is up here, that's the inverse part where uh, the rate of A is up here and the molar mass of A is down here. So inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of those particles. That is known as Graham's law of infusion. We always used to teach this in honors chemistry up to about four years ago, and we just decided to stop. It was just, uh, we had a lab that we did with it, and we just needed a couple more days to do other stuff, and this was a one of the latest victims of, I don't know, going slower. Um, I can show you where this equation relates to what we were doing yesterday with the mean square velocity. And I don't expect you to derive this equation at all. So it's up to you if you want to jot this down or, uh, or not. But if we did root mean square velocity of gas A, and the root mean square velocity of gas B. When we were looking at this uh, day before yesterday, root mean square velocity has that little equation. It's three. We've got R and T, Kelvin temperature, universal gas law constant. The temperature of gas A. And then if we did the same thing for gas B, we'd have 3RP, and we'd have the molar mass of gas B down here. So that simplifies to that, rate to rate, and then the molar masses is over here. Now, if the 3 cancels out in both the numerator and denominator, and the R cancels out, and we're doing this at the same temperature, then it basically becomes 1 over MA divided by the square root of 1 over MB. And that simplifies into the 1 over something divided by 1 over something flips the, flips the numerator and denominator. So that's why they get flipped over here. And uh, that inverse thing works its way in there. So it is based on the root mean square velocity calculation. It's just uh, simplified in this form over here. So let's put that to use. I'll show you how to solve something using that equation. So, here. 
I want to calculate the ratio, rate of fusion, or the ratio of the fusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride. Basically, the lightest molar mass gas and the heaviest molar mass gas. Um, uranium hexafluoride used in the enrichment of uranium for nuclear reactors. So what I'm going to do is say rate hydrogen. At six is going to be the molar mass kitty corner. You have six on the top, the molar mass of hydrogen on the bottom. I could flip this and this and flip that and that, but um. Look next. Now I want to compare the rates. So I'm basically solving for the rate ratio here. And to do that, I'm going to solve hydrogen. And I'm going to set the rate of the uranium hexafluoride to one. One meter per second, one mile per hour, one light year per year. I don't know. But I'm just going to set it to one. I just have to have a comparison, a ratio, the speed of this compared to the speed of this. If I set the heavier one equal to one, then I'll find out how many times faster the hydrogen is when I solve for this. So uh, this is going to be the molar mass of uranium hexafluoride, just 352 points. And this is 2.016, the molar mass of the hydrogen. You could, uh, you don't have to do this one in kilograms per mole like we did with the um, other equation. This equation required us to use uh, kilograms per mole for the equation because of the R value and making everything work. It's just the way that equation works. But this one, as long as you're comparing a mass to a mass, uh, the units are going to cancel out anyway. The proportion is going to be the same whether it's kilo kilograms per mole or uh, grams per mole. So. Uh, I never have, for this equation, done anything other than grams per mole in grams law. So make a little note of that. After this equation. Uh, I kind of box myself out of space here. Uh, when I solve this, it comes out to be 13.2. So I've got a rate of 13.2 to 1. <laughs> Another way of thinking of that, where I like 13.2 times faster. Or or you have six times faster. When I'm solving for uh, relative rates, I always like to set the heavier one equal to one and solve for the rate of the, the lighter one because it's going to be that many times faster. If I set the hydrogen to one and solve for the uranium hexafluoride, then I would get some decimal number and it'd be it's like Uranium hexafluoride travels at this fraction of the speed of hydrogen. It doesn't look as good that way. And we see that over here. Uh, we've got a Boltzmann distribution, uh, number of particles traveling at a particular speed, um, both at the same temperature. And we see the uranium hexafluoride being heavy particles, like the heaviest gas particles, have a very narrow range at that temperature, but being so much lighter and faster for hydrogen, they have a wider range of velocities at that temperature. And then a little twist to that one. If you're not solving for uh, the rate, you might be solving for a molar mass. 
Example two, gas A has a molar mass of 36.5 grams per mole, travels at a velocity of 450 meters per second when it's at 25 degrees Celsius. At the same temperature, gas B travels at 660 meters per second, and from that information, we can identify the molar mass of gas B. So I have 450 meters per second over here for one gas, and the other is traveling at 660 meters per second. So I got my rate to rate comparison. When I'm going over here to do the molar mass, just got to make it goes with the 36.5. And I'm solving for the 660s molar mass. Um, I don't know. I'll just call that guess. When I set this up, um, I purposely set it up so the variable that I'm solving for is in the numerator. Algebraically speaking, it's just easier to solve for when you put your variable in the numerator. So, you know, you could have flipped it around the 660 and the 450 and the 36.5 and and the molar mass, you could have done completely upside down for what I have and still get the right answer. But algebraically speaking, it's a little, a little bit clumsier to solve. Um, now, I want to get molar mass by itself. I got a little bit of a problem, though. I got that square root sign. If I want to get the molar mass isolated by itself, what could I do to free up that variable? Square both sides. Excellent. If I square this side and I square this side, it gets rid of the square root sign. So then that would simplify to 0.465 is the molar mass of gas B over 36.5. And then solve for that left hand side because there's no variable over there. So multiply both sides by 36.5 now. And the molar mass of gas B would be 16.96. And then if I'm looking at multiplication division, I got the uh, 450 and the 660. Those only have two sig figs. Run that up to 17 grams per mole. It should make sense. Gas B is a smaller molar mass. It travels faster. And gas A at the uh, bigger molar mass, it travels slower. So you're either solving for rate using Graham's law or you're solving for the molar mass. You got three of the four pieces, it's just finding the missing piece. Um, related to that, There's a little uh, diagram here. I'm going to just explain this a little bit. Um, before we cut this from the honors curriculum, we used to do this lab. That's why it says recall the gas law diffusion lab from first year chemistry that we don't do. But here's a picture of what it would look like. In this lab, what we would do is we'd, uh, we'd be doing Graham's law and calculating where two gases collide based on their relative rates of uh, motion based on their uh, rate of diffusion. One of the, uh, we have, a, so what we had is these meter long glass tubes. And on one end of the tube, we would take a cotton ball that was soaked with ammonium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide gives off ammonia gas as it vaporizes. It's very volatile. It's the smelling salt stuff that you've seen me use sometimes to, uh, I don't know pick on somebody. So wave a little ammonium hydroxide under their nose. It's like getting punched in the face. It doesn't hurt you. It's what they use in smelling salts, but it's very volatile, gives off a lot of gas, and it hits you like a like a brick when it when you inhale it. Um, on the other end of that tube, we douse a cotton ball with hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is also very volatile. And if you catch a lung full of that, it like burns your lungs cause damage. So you're not supposed to breathe in vapors of hydrochloric acid. So we thought, what would be better to take a really volatile base and a volatile uh, acid and bring them out into the lab in full strength concentrations and let 
students uh, choke on the fumes. That sounds like a lot of fun. Whenever we do this lab, I should just show you this. I got some back here. Right, and kind of open up a new bottle of ammonium hydroxide. Anybody want to smell the ammonium hydroxide? I saw the nod. I, I know you don't want to, though. You value your lungs too much. Anybody? Hiss when it opened. Yep, it's a good bet. <laughs> you don't have to get too close. <laughs> it won't hurt you. Okay. You... <laughs> just, just, a, just a little. Sound like you're a little stuck up. I got a picture of that. <laughs> that was not a walk. That was like puppy. Oh, you feel your brain turn down a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it just takes your sinuses and just goes, <clears throat> makes them spasm a little bit. <laughs> it's going to take a few seconds for your head to come back to the full size it was. But uh, I bet you're breathing better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I would not have you do that with hydrochloric acid. Because hydrochloric acid would then uh, mix with the fluids in your lungs and turn them acidic. and that causes damage. But this, safe enough to wave under your star quarterback's nose when he's unconscious on the football field and, you know, he's worth millions. Anyway, uh, so when we did this lab, the vapors of this mix with the vapors of this and it makes a cloud like this. The cloud's actually pretty harmless. I'm not too worried about that. But if you have <laughs> I don't want to breathe the hydrochloric acid fumes. That's why I'm backing away from that. If you have this cloud of smoke going at every lab table, both sides of the lab table, it looked like reefer madness in here. I mean, people would come by and this cloud of smoke and all the students are like making funny faces because of the, the fumes that they're, they're inhaling and everybody was like... It was a very entertaining and stressful lab because those are dangerous by themselves. And then you got this cloud of smoke and you can't see the back of the room. It was, it was probably good that we cut this one out of the curriculum. Anyway, so you take one gas, you put it here, take the other one, you're gonna put it there. You got these little wads of, of cotton that have it on there. And you and your lab partner, they would go one, two, three, and one would stick one in one end, one would stick the one in the other end, and then the gases are in the tube. And then they start moving towards each other, and eventually they find each other somewhere between the space, and they form a cloud. And you can imagine what that cloud would look like. But instead of being just like a big cloud, it forms this thin ring, this like smoke ring, and just hovers there where they collide with each other. So uh, turns out ammonia, which has a molar mass of 17.034 grams per mole. And HCl, which has a molar mass of 36.458 grams per mole, um, would meet here for that ring, much closer to the HCl side, further away from the ammonia side. So at a glance, that makes sense. This gas moves faster because it's lighter. This gas moves slower because it's heavier. So where they meet should be further away from the ammonia and closer to the HCl. And uh, just in case you're wondering, at 25 degrees Celsius, this moves at 660 
meters per second, and this is about 450 meters per second. And if those numbers look familiar, it's because this was ammonia and this was hydrochloric acid up here. But when we did this lab, there's another thing about it that was hard to wrap your head around a little bit. Where they come together, they make a, uh, a smoke cloud of ammonia chloride, but it would take at least three minutes before you'd even start to notice anything. And then it was really faint. And after about six minutes, it was pretty clear that you had a smoke ring forming there. And uh, after 12 minutes, it kind of started to expand a little bit more. It was, it was, it was kind of out of control by that point. But my question is, this is a one meter long tube. This is traveling at 660 meters per second. This is traveling at 450 meters per second. Why would it take three minutes before you could even notice a cloud? Six minutes before it was actually like very distinct. Why would it take so long for those particles to get there? What do you think? Um, for like diffusion to actually happen so the particles can get together. All they have to do is bump into each other to make the cloud. Those are the temperatures at about room temperature, the velocities at about room temperature. Kind of like the line suggests that they're bouncing around in a random direction, bouncing into each other, not just dropping straight down the tube. That's, that's a big part of it. They're, they're not moving in a straight line. Um, as you saw, like in the animations, they're just bumping into each other. So if you were to, you know, go back to these diagrams and just follow like one particle, okay, it's hard to do now. Way too many in there. But if you're trying to follow one particle. Oh, I know I can do. I can put one. There we go. Try to find, follow that red one. You know, to go say, okay, this red one just hit that wall. How long is it going to take it to get over here to this wall? Okay, pretty fast actually in that case. <laughs> but uh, it's not a straight shot. There's a lot of other stuff in the way. Keep in mind he's faster than all the other ones, and this is slowed down for us to be able to view. But you got all those uh, collisions taking place along the way. Yep, wrong class. So another thing that you don't uh, necessarily think about is before this even started, it wasn't a vacuum. This was in the room. This tube had air in it. So it's filled with air to begin with. So you got to navigate your way through all the air particles. You got to bounce off the hydrogen, uh, the, the nitrogen gas and the oxygen gas. Um, kind of working your way through the cloud to get to the other side. Sometimes you hit another uh, particle, whether it's ammonia or uh, oxygen or nitrogen, and you bounce back the wrong direction, so you're going the wrong way. Sometimes you're going the right way, but either way, um, it's not a straight shot going to the other side. Um, I'm not gonna write all that down, but just keep that in mind, keep in mind that squiggly line and the indirect path that they take. We actually, uh, in that lab, would calculate where that cloud would be, and while they were waiting for that cloud to develop, we'd calculate where it should be based on Graham's law. And, uh, and based on the math, the rate of this one and the rate of that one, that's where they should meet. And sure enough, it almost always perfectly worked that way. The only thing that would make those numbers be a little bit off is if when they put the cotton balls in there, they put one in before the other. That would shift it to give one a head start 
That would be the only thing that would make it go wrong. But I'm not going to have you calculate those distances because I don't believe. All right, let's take a look at uh, the last section, some things about real gases. Um, when I solve for the when I'm solving for the rate, I always like to set the heavier one equal to one and yeah. solve for the lighter one because then okay. I can find out how many times faster the lighter one is. So it would be whatever over one or one over whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you could get a situation like this where maybe you know the mass and you know molar mass of both of those, and you're given the velocity of one of them then you could solve for the velocity of the other one using the units that are used. But when they don't give that, when they just want to compare rates, you set one of them to one. And that makes everything go pretty easy then. All right, uh, real gases. An ideal gas is a hypothetical concept, even though we spend most of our time treating things like they're an ideal gas. <laughs> no gas exactly follows the ideal gas law. Although many gases come very close, at low pressure and or high temperature. Thus, ideal gas behavior can be best thought of as the behavior approached by real gases under certain conditions. In this chapter, the ideal gas law has been used in all calculations with the assumption that it applies exactly. Under ordinary conditions, this assumption is a good one. However, all real gases deviate at least slightly from a real gas behavior. And all gases are real, so all gases deviate at least slightly from ideal gas behavior. When they say under ordinary conditions, they're talking about room temperature, room pressure, stuff that we're accustomed to. And if you think about it, as far as pressure goes, we're on the really low end of pressure. I mean, one atmosphere, uh, 760 millimeters of mercury, that's, that's low. I mean, pressure can go up. There's no limit on how high it can go. It can go down to zero. We're at one. It can go up to thousands, tens of thousands, if you, if you have the technology to push that. We, we live in a pretty thin atmosphere. Um, I mean, better than the moon, better than Mars, but it's still pretty thin. And uh, as far as temperatures go, um, we're relatively high. I mean, I guess zero Kelvin is one extreme. The, the thing is, we're still on the lower end of that temperature scale. I mean, temperatures can go up to the hundreds of thousands of Kelvins in nuclear warhead goes off and you get a hundred million Kelvin. I mean, that's, that's pretty hot. Vaporize. But, uh, but 273 is considered, you know, okay, it's fairly modest, I guess, in terms of temperature. So under normal conditions, gases have that lower pressure, reasonably warm temperature thing going on. The table below shows the extent to which two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, deviate from ideality, ideal behavior, at different temperatures and pressures. The data compared the exper experimentally observed molar volume with the molar volume calculated from the ideal gas law. So uh, if you take PV equals NRT and you solve for V, there's what it should be according to PV equals NRT, ideal gas law, the way we calculate it typically. And then there's what it actually is. And one of the things that we notice here for oxygen is that when the pressure is pretty low and the temperature is pretty balmy, like 50 degrees Celsius, I mean, that's hot, but no deviation from ideal behavior. The gas behaves ideally. Oxygen gas at 50 degrees Celsius, no problem. And even at zero degrees Celsius, um, 273 Kelvin, 
minor variance from ideal behavior. Negligible, we might say. But when it starts getting really cold, deviates even more. But if we have the pressure going up, we'll notice as the pressure goes up, at all the temperatures, it deviates more. And if the pressure is high and the temperature is low, you've got close to a 20% deviation from ideal behavior over here. That's not very good. If you're using PV equals N or T to solve your, your oxygen gas, at pressures of 100 and temperatures of minus 50 Celsius, your answer is not going to be very good <coughs> using the ideal gas law because the gas is not behaving ideally at those high pressure cold temperatures. Um, 50 degrees, okay, it's pretty good, even at, uh, at one atmosphere. And even, uh, you know, across those temperatures at one atmosphere, low pressure, it's, it's doing okay. I, I would accept that. I wouldn't worry about the ideal gas law not working. But when the pressure goes up, I mean, 60% air almost, it's not even, you're not even ballparking it very good. And here, they can't even have numbers because it doesn't exist as a gas at those temperatures. So it's like 100% air there because it's condensed into a liquid and the gas laws no, no longer apply at that point. So um, low pressures, high temperatures, ideal gas law is good. Other than that, things fall apart. It should be obvious from this table that deviations from ideality, from ideal behavior, become larger at high pressure. And low temperatures. Well, this in first year come a little bit. We say, okay, high pressure, low temperature, not ideal. That makes gases behave real. But don't confuse it with the opposite, because low pressures and high temperatures, that makes things behave ideally. So don't flip them in your head. Um, I, real versus ideal. <clears throat> Moreover, the deviations are larger for carbon dioxide than oxygen. All these effects can be correlated in a simple terms of a simple common sense sense observation, which would go something like this. In general, the closer gas to its liquid state, more it will deviate. Uh, even at 100 atmospheres of pressure at minus 50 degrees Celsius, oxygen's still a gas, but carbon dioxide, it's already condensed to a liquid at that point, so it's completely annihilated the ideal gas law at those temperatures and pressures. Um, yeah? Do you like the relationships? Um, so, like, matter here, like, low pressure or Ideal gas means a higher volume for a ideal gas. So uh, you will see the deviations sometimes being um, above and below, and we're going to see that at the bottom of the next page. So we'll see that we can actually, at certain conditions, be below the standard volume, and then at other conditions be above the standard volume, but just not following ideal either way. From a molecular point uh, standpoint or molecular point of view, deviations from ideal gas law arise because the kinetic 
molecular theory neglects two important factors that occurs with two gases. Remember, the kinetic molecular theory just helps us explain why gases do what they do for ideal gas law. And if gases follow all those assumptions or those postulates, they're behaving like an ideal gas. But if you break any of the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory, you start behaving like an ideal gas, uh, a real gas. You're a rule breaker. You're a, a real gas. So here are the two things that uh, are most commonly broken in the kinetic molecular theory that makes you behave real. And first one, at low temperatures and high pressures, attractive forces between gas particles become much more important. One of the things the kinetic molecular theory tells us is that there's no attractive or repulsive forces between gas particles. They behave independently of each other. Two gas particles pass each other in the night and they just fly right past each other. But um, what we're seeing with real gases is intermolecular forces are actually a pretty important thing. And two gas particles passing each other, there's a high probability if they pass close that they're gonna bump into each other and stick to each other with the intermolecular forces. And when gas particles start sticking, ideal gas uh, behavior starts going away. They start behaving like a real gas. So I'm gonna say, um, I just wanna underline few keywords here, deviations from ideal gas law. Um, because of the neglecting of two important factors. This is a pretty important thing to keep in mind because it's gonna come up in written responses for sure on the test. First off, it's those attractive forces. Um, you know them as intermolecular forces, IMFs. Things like London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole uh, attractions, hydrogen bonding. These are the things that make molecules stick to other molecules. They're polar. If they have uh, nonpolar molecules can make weak London dispersion forces. Polar molecules can make dipole-dipole attractions. If you have really strong dipoles or really strong polarity, you can even make H bonds between molecules. So kinetic molecular theory doesn't really account for those intermolecular forces, but real gases have them, so we shouldn't ignore them. When the temperature is high and the pressure is low, these aren't that important. And that's why kinetic molecular theory works under most conditions. But when the uh, temperature goes lower, the particles are moving slower, and when the particles are moving by each other slower, it's easier to grab onto your neighbor. I like two people running down the hallway versus two people walking down the hallway. If you're running at each other in opposite directions and you try to grab hands, you're going to just scratch each other or dislocate somebody's shoulder or you know, dislocate somebody's wrist or something like that. But if you're walking past each other and you try to grab hands, you can probably latch on and you know, pull each other close and do a little, you know, hug thing or whatever, do -si do or whatever you want to do. But uh, the velocity matters and that's controlled by temperature. And at high pressure, um, the higher the pressure, the closer the particles are to each other, the more often they're going to bump into each other. So there's more opportunities to have those intermolecular forces work at high pressure because there's more collisions and more bumping on going on. Two people running blindly down the hallway toward each other with like a blindfold on, the chances of them running into each other, eh. But if you have them running blindly down the hallway during passing period, the chances of them bumping into somebody is almost like absolute. So uh, I suppose people might want to step out of the way. Higher pressure, more collisions. Uh, the second idea is at high pressure, the amount of empty space between the gas particles is greatly reduced and the, uh, the volume of the individual particles can no longer be considered negligible or zero. Which is what I mean by that. So we say that gases are mostly empty space and the size of the individual gas particle is negligible compared to the size of the space between the particles. But if you
you got the same number of particles, you got less space. Now the space between the particles is smaller. And relative to the uh, size of the particles, the size of these particles are more substantial, they're more important. They're no longer negligible sized particles. And uh, basically what it's acknowledging is those particles have volume and they're more likely to collide with each other when the volume is smaller. So take away the empty space, more frequent collisions. So we're going to look at that um, a little bit more in detail here. I kind of already said some of this stuff because I get ahead of myself sometimes. But let's look at those attractive forces, those intermolecular forces a little bit more here. At lower temperatures and therefore lower velocities, the attractive forces between gas particles becomes more prominent or more important. The intermolecular attractive forces tends to pull the particles toward one another significantly. Reducing the space between them. Significantly reducing the space between them. <laughs> At high pressure, the number of gas particles is concentrated in a small volume of space. The close proximity of gas particles creates more opportunities for collisions between particles and more opportunities for attractions between particles. Because every time they bump into each other, there's just another opportunity for them to line up their, their dipoles, create an intermolecular force, and stick to each other. A dense concentration of gas particles can actually reduce the pressure exerted on the walls of the container because gas particles be attracted the gases in the container actually of the container. So We got a low pressure, lower pressure on the left. A little bit higher pressure over here. Fewer particles, more particles, because more pressure, more crowded, more collisions. So let's say this particle is, you know, bouncing around in the container, a lot of empty space. It's about to crash into this container and it has some other atoms nearby it that could exert some intermolecular forces on it. So if this one's slightly attracted to it and this one's slightly attracted to it, they act kind of like a little tractor beam. They kind of pull it back from colliding into the wall. This guy's probably too far away to do anything. But if you have more particles near you, more collisions and more particles in proximity to you, this particle here is being pulled towards those particles, at least some of them, because of their dipoles and their intermolecular attractions. And that's going to reduce the impact that that particle has with the walls. So uh, sticking to each other is going to reduce the velocity or the impact with the wall. Now, if I look at uh, this chart over here, I can kind of notice a few things about what might be some factors that influence that. If I look here, first off, I got a couple uh, diatomics. Diatomics are nonpolar. 
So they, they make the weakest kind of intermolecular attractions, the one the dispersion forces. Uh, got a couple, I got three uh, nonpolar diatomics here. I got two noble gases. They're also nonpolar because the electrons pretty much are uniformly distributed around them. And then I've got uh, a nonpolar carbon dioxide. Ammonia is polar. Ammonia is lopsided. So we get uh, a negative dipole on the nitrogen end, a positive dipole on the hydrogen end. It's a lopsided molecule. It has strong positive and negative dipoles. But all the other ones are nonpolar. So it's got the strongest intermolecular forces. So one of the things I know is, notice here with these uh, gases and how they deviate, is if I look at the molar volume at zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, so that's, you know, pretty normal conditions, STP conditions. They're pretty close to that 22.4 liters of volume, um, 22.39 or 22.4. So they're pretty close. Um, and nonpolar molecules tend not to uh, have strong intermolecular attractions, so it's a, they minimize those attractive forces. But if I take a look at the ammonia, ammonia likes to grab onto other ammonias, and those attractive forces are significant, and the 22.4 goes down to closer to 22.1 or, or so. Um, the attractive forces are a difference things. Um, the bigger a nonpolar molecule, the more uh, polarizable it is, we say. We'll look at that term later on in the year. But um, the more disrupted its electron cloud can become and the more uh, stronger its intermolecular forces can be. So even though um, carbon dioxide is nonpolar, it's a pretty big molecule compared to some of these other ones and it's going to deviate uh, and have stronger uh, dipoles than the other nonpolar ones. All the bigger ones tend to deviate more, like oxygen is bigger than nitrogen, it deviates a little bit more. Uh, the smaller they are, the less they should deviate. So intermolecular forces and the size of the molecule make a big difference there. And then uh, focusing a little bit on that particle volume aspect, under normal pressure conditions, we be, would be able to ignore the volume of the gas particles themselves. But under high pressure, these same gas particles are a more substantial part of the measured volume of the gas. Um, so here what we're looking at is three different gases. Uh, And one of the things that we're going to see is that when we look at the uh, deviation from ideal gas law behavior, when the pressure is low, all those gases, nitrogen, methane, hydrogen, CO2, they're all pretty close to ideal behavior. And most of the time when we study them, we're pretty close to, you know, one atmosphere, give or take, you know, 10. We don't see a lot of deviation, and that's why the ideal gas law works for us most of the time. But as the pressure goes up, we see some things um, deviate less, like the hydrogen's not as bad, but other things deviate a lot more. The carbon dioxide dips down here and then goes above the line here. So there's a, a wide amount of fluctuation at, at, uh, with different compounds at different pressures here. Take away more of the empty space, and uh, deviations become more prominent. On this side, we have the same gas, but at three different temperatures. So uh, again, 
Ideal gas behavior, the dotted line here. Oops, I'm not in if I go on. Um, when the pressure is low, we're behaving ideally. Taking into account the temperature now, uh, when the temperatures are still on the lower side, we get more deviation. But as the temperature gets warmer and warmer, we start seeing that line get closer and closer. And at this warmer temperature here, if we brought the temperature up even higher, we'd see even less deviation. So uh, keep the temperatures high, keep the pressures low, and you're not going to deviate much from ideal behavior. But uh, high pressure makes a big difference as well as the attractive forces between particles. So knowing that those factors take place, going on to this last page, allows us to adjust for real gas behavior using an equation called the Van der Waal equation. Van der Waal is the guy that came up with the idea of intermolecular forces. Van der Waal, he was a uh, Danish, I believe. He said, because real gases do not follow ideal gas law, we need to modify PV equals NRT to accommodate variations that real gases bring with them. Adjustments for the attractive forces is going to be A. There's an adjustment factor here. Here's A. And between the particles and the volume of the gas particle itself, which is B, the volume adjustment up on the table here. Hydrogen balloon can be made using Van der Waals equation. So what he's doing in this equation is taking P and NRT and adjusting for the higher pressure and the uh, corrected volume of the gas. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Here's a short of it. A is a correction factor for pressure. B is a correction factor for the volume of the gas. Now, it also is taking into account those intermolecular forces and doesn't really like specify that there, but <clears throat> every compound has its own unique set of, you know, its own unique volume. Every gas has its own unique volume, as well as its uh, different polarity and, and intermolecular forces. So, for example, I see something that's polar, uh, like water, and it's got a big correction factor. Uh, not a very big molecule, but it's got a big correction factor because water molecules like to stick to each other. Uh, ammonia is also polar because of the stickiness. Nonpolar, nonpolar, nonpolar. I think almost, yeah, all the rest of them are nonpolar. Um, here to here, it's all nonpolar. So these have stronger intermolecular forces. They also need a stronger correction factor because they're going to deviate more from ideal behavior. So I'm going to show you uh, with an example of how ideal would look versus the corrected would work. And Start with the ideal. Example one, part A. You want to store 165 grams of CO2 in a 12 and a half liter tank, room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Calculate the pressure of the gas using ideal gas law. So I'm going to take the 165 grams and get that into moles real quick. Three point seven CO2. Then I'm going to use PV equals NRT. Sure. Uh, NRT 
to the OD. And if we put some numbers in there, we would have 3.75. was the volume. It comes out to be 7.33 atmospheres. This is going to be the ideal pressure using just straight out keep equals enter T. Very normal way for us to solve for it that way. But that's not necessarily going to be ideal. Uh, it's not going to be the real. Uh, that's ideal. That's not going to be the real pressure that we'd get. So now we're going to recalculate it using the Van der Waal equation. And that equation is provided to you. So it's just a matter of, and the charts provided to you. So it's just a matter of plugging in some numbers. We're going to try to solve for the observed pressure that we'd get for this. Using the table for A and B. And what you're going to find is you just, you're going to use a couple things uh, more than once. You're going to use moles here, you're going to use your moles here and here. You're just going to use it in three spots. You're going to use your volume uh, in two spots. So you're going to use a couple things more than you did before because of the adjustments and making the units cancel out and such. But here's what it would set up like. Um, We're solving for P observed. We're going to add to that the A value for carbon dioxide, which is this value here, 3.59. Multiply that by the moles over the volume squared. So the moles was 3.75 and the volume is 12.5 liters. That's going to be multiplied by the other adjustment for volume, the corrected volume. And that's going to be the volume minus the moles times the B factor. So that's going to be multiplied by minus 7, 5 times the adjustment factor of 0.427, that's all equal to NRT, which is 3.75 moles, 0 0.0821, and 298 Kelvin. Got to solve for P. I always have to simplify this in solving for it, so I would take P observed. <laughs> I would simplify this little part of it. I can I simplify this part of it here. That would come out three, two, three, one. This comes out to be uh, 12.34, and the NRT comes out to be 91.75. So I try to simplify it a little bit. Then I would divide both sides by 12.34. So I'd have P observed plus 0 0.2231 equals. 7.435, and now I could uh, subtract 0 0.3231 from both sides. So because of the attractive force between the particles and the higher pressure, um, taking away some of the empty space, accounting for the volume of those particles. Instead of getting 7.33, ideally, the reality 
the real pressure would be 7.11. Now, having walked you through that particular problem, the College Board, when they did a redesign a few years ago, decided that they were not going to have you solve for that value, but they want you to be able to talk about all the factors that lead up to that. So they wanted, you would want you to know that we have an adjustment factor for the volume and the pressure and uh, that there would be these attractive forces and the volume of the particles isn't negligible and all that stuff that leads up to that equation, they want you to be able to talk about it that way because they feel that that shows you a, shows that you have an understanding of it and they typically will not have you solve for it this way. That doesn't mean your textbook author does it that way. The textbook author does whatever they want because it's still college chemistry. But uh, the college board decided that they were not gonna emphasize that equation. What I tend to do is I give you the equation, and I do have one that's math here. And here's, here's kind of my philosophy on that. The College Board, a few years ago, decided that they were gonna basically cut out a lot of the math concepts from chemistry because it was discriminatory to students that didn't know how to do math as well. So they wanted to basically make it more accessible to everybody, and they took away a lot of the math, which basically takes away the college level rigor of it to a certain extent. But what I always get frustrated with with that is that our students at Brookfield East tend to have a good background in math and it took away our strength. So actually when they adjusted the test and made it easier by taking out the math, our students did worse because now we had to rely on our words. We're not as good with that. So um, it, it's, it's trying to find a balance there. That I, I understand why they did it. I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, I, I have no personal fondness or affinity for this equation. I mean, I could take it or leave it. I think it's important to know all the stuff that leads up to it, but I'm gonna put it on the test. I give you the A's and the B's. I'll probably, I'm gonna have you solve for like the P observed. Um, so practice that. There's probably one in your homework that will have you do that as well. But just keep in mind the college board wouldn't have you use it because they don't think the math is important for this particular topic. And for this time, I agree with them. Some of the other stuff they cut for the math, I don't agree with, but. You don't have to memorize them. Um, I will give the root mean square velocity equation because that's on the equation sheet um, that I gave you yesterday. I'm gonna give you Everything that's in the old one that has, it says gases, liquids, and solutions. So I'll basically give you that whole back page of the equations, and you will see the root mean square velocity equation in two forms there, and you'll see Graham's law, uh, a couple equations below that. There are a couple equations in there that we haven't done because they're part of solutions. So don't think you have to use every equation in there. But um, the second one down, you'll see is the uh, Van der Waal adjustment equations right under PV equals NRT. They have the, uh, they have this right under PV equals NRT. Now I have not tried this and I just got a few minutes. So I just want to the I noticed that they have a diffusion uh, part on this PHET thing, and I've never done it before, so I just want to see what happens. Uh, we're going to have two different gases. I don't know. I'll put 30 particles of A in this side and 30 particles of A in that side. Uh, right now, they have the same atomic mass. 
I don't know. Uh, let's do like the hydrogen, uh, the, the ammonia mass, which was 17 and 36.5 over here. We'll make it, okay, it can only go up to 32. So let's do it, at, we'll do 16 and 32. Um, and the radius, we'll make the one that's lighter, smaller radius, see if that makes a difference. And we'll keep the temperature the same. And then if we remove the divider, we're gonna see how they mix. And uh, we should be seeing that the blue ones make it over to the right side faster than the red ones, just because they're lighter and smaller and they're gonna encounter, uh, they're gonna move faster, they're gonna get there faster. Um, because they have less volume, they're less likely to collide with their neighbors. But I don't know, that's not as exciting as I was hoping it would be. 